Hello everyone, today I'll be narrating three new creepy posts that I found off of the Let's Not Meet subreddit. Liking this video and subscribing to my channel helps me a lot. After you've heard these stories, let me know what you think of them in the comments below. But without further ado, let's dive straight into their experiences. These are their stories. I am 20 years old. I live in the suburbs in a small residence of six houses. My gate is very often broken, including today. That means 80% of the time it is wide open, so everyone can fit into the small courtyard. My house has one floor. There are four bedrooms, including mine, and downstairs there is a guest bedroom, which is used as a treatment room because I have big health concerns. This is where all the equipment, medicines are stored, like morphine and doses that could kill an average person, and this is where the care takes place. Also, I have a dog. I am very close to him. He is a little bit all of my life. He feels everything to the point of feeling my epileptic seizures before they happen. To recognize the nurses who are arriving, he recognizes by the sound of their tires when they arrive in the yard. He never barks except when there is a problem. And finally, a nurse spends four to five times a day to give me care at home, including infusions. This is important for the story. That morning, like every morning, my liberal nurse arrived at 8 a.m. For the rest of the story, I'll call her Sandra. She takes care of me as usual. That is to say, an infusion of of a painkiller. She replaces the antibiotic diffusers, she makes me do blood tests, and remakes the cassette of my morphine pump. We usually chat about everything and nothing. She tells me stories with patients during the treatment. My nurses are an integral part of my life. They have looked after me for six years now. She leaves after 40 minutes and says, see you later. I'm sure I'll be a little late. Don't worry. That day, I have a medical appointment in the morning, and I'm alone all day because my parents are working. They accept the nurse's passage every four hours. Once back from my meeting, I sit on the sofa with my dog while waiting for my nurse. After a while, I hear the tire noises. I get up because I think it's the nurse, but my dog started to growl behind the door. I look at the time, 11.50 a.m. I tell myself that it is a bit early, but sometimes instead of going after, my nurse exchanges me with the patient from before. I hear a knock, surprised. I go to open it, usually the nurses come in like that, and I see a young woman standing, whom I have never seen. She said to me, hello, are you my name? I'm Camille, a third year nursing student. Your nurse will be a little late so she told me to come and start preparing and she will arrive. I'm not wary at all, I'm used to students coming, but I'm just a little surprised that Sandra didn't warn me, because usually she warns me in the morning or sends me a message, and then she never leaves a student alone when it's the first time we see each other. I tell myself she must have forgotten to tell me. I bring her in and show her the way to the treatment room. I take out the things for treatment while she washes her hands. My dog is weird. He growls at her as soon as she approaches me and he turns around me. I was embarrassed so I left him in the living room and closed the door to be quiet. I don't really care what she does so I let her do it. I am on my phone at the moment. She begins to put the IV on the infusion stand and takes a syringe. Normally, we rinse my central catheter with a syringe of serum already made. You just have to open the packaging, and there I see it's not a pre-made syringe, but a syringe that she has prepared. I look up and see that the ampules for my treatments are intact and have not been opened, yet I did hear the sound of the ampules breaking. I am starting to think it's weird, and there she starts to approach me to inject the syringe when I get a message from my nurse. I'll be there in five minutes. Can you start pulling out the material? My blood has only run for one spin. I got up and said, I'm just going to the toilet, I'll be right back. I ran and locked myself in the downstairs toilet, the whole time my dog was barking and growling. When I opened the door, he followed me straight up so we were both in the toilet. So I sent a message to my nurse, Camille, your student is here, don't worry. And then she replied, who? I started crying in the toilet and was really scared. Camille came by and asked, is everything okay? I think she could see I was staying a long time. I said, yes, it's going to happen. Then I heard my front door slam. Two minutes later, I hear it re open but I hear my nurse. I came out of the toilet crying. She asked me what happened. I told her about it and showed the treatment room. So we called the police, they came and they examined, took samples, and the syringe and the rest of what Camille had prepared. The test results were received a few days after receiving the products in the syringe and the infusion. In the syringe was a paralyzer. She had put a dose that could have paralyzed a man of 120 kilograms. I'm 40 kilograms. And in the IV, it was medicine to lower the heart rate. But it was so concentrated it could have stopped anyone's heart. Today, we still don't know who Camille is. And luckily, I have never heard from her again. In retrospect, I realized that my dog had sensed that this person didn't want me well. And I tell myself that I should have watched her because she was just a student. And that my treatments are not paracetamol, and I keep wondering what could have happened if I hadn't looked at my phone.
This happened about a year ago. There were so many terrible factors working against me that night. I am astounded I got away, at least physically. This all begins when I'm at my friend's apartment, who lives in a really rough part of town. In a series of poor decisions, that night I decided to get belligerently drunk and take a few pills of whatever knows what. I know, I know. Safe to say, after a solid night of partying, around 4am I was not in the right state of mind. My drugged brain decides that instead of staying the night at my friend's apartment like I normally would, I wanted to uber back to my own apartment. My friend's apartment had two separate entrances slash access to the building, one in the back unlit parking lot of the building and one facing the street. They had two sets of keys for each door and I only had keys to the one in the back of the apartment. Since my uber would obviously arrive at the street and the door in the front of the building locks itself behind you, I exited this way when the driver was soon to arrive. I'm not paying attention to my surroundings at all in this state, despite the fact that there was literally a bullet hole in the front door I just came out of. Not good. I remember checking to see what car I was getting picked up in, and was only able to pick out the fact that it was a black sedan. Soon after stepping outside, a black sedan pulls up to the curb and starts rolling down the window. So I stepped forward. Before this man even spoke, I could feel something was wrong. He had an expression like he was tearing me apart with just his eyes. After seeing that look, it gave me a new meaning to the word predator. To describe a criminal because I then knew what it felt like to be prey. He basically barks at me, I'm your Uber driver. This was the second red flag that somehow made its way through my brain. Normally Uber drivers just roll down the window and say your name. I think I just stared at him for a second, my brain slowly piecing together the situation I was potentially in, and I ask him, what's my name? He immediately is enraged and starts screaming about how he doesn't have time for this and just get in the car, etc. I don't think I've ever sobered up so fast in my life. I'm completely panicking. Obviously, this wasn't my Uber. Quickly checking the license plate, I immediately see it's not a match. Meanwhile, this guy is still screaming at me, and I have absolutely no idea what to do. If I bolt in either direction, this guy could easily outrun me or have a weapon. I'm also pretty sure at this point that if he's trying to nab a random girl off the street, he must have a weapon of some sort. I can't run back into the apartment door right behind me since it locks behind you, and I don't have the keys, nor the time to unlock it. Running towards the back door would do nothing as well, as he's idling right by the mouth of the driveway towards the back parking lot. And again, I would have to take the time to find the right keys and get in. If I screamed, I'm not exactly in the type of neighborhood where someone would try to be vigilant, and I can still hear the music radiating from my friend's third floor apartment. I knew they wouldn't hear me. Also, it's 4am and absolutely no one is around. It was the absolute worst feeling I've ever felt in my life. Everything in me wanted to run, but I felt that if I did, it would be the end of me. But if I kept standing there, staring in shock at this screaming man, the result would be the same. From when he started screaming at me to this point, I'm guessing only 20 seconds has passed by. Just as he's looking like he's getting ready to get out of the car, another black sedan pulls up right behind him. Checking the license plate as quickly as I can, I realize it's my actual Uber and make a full sprint to the car, really only like 6 steps, and throw myself in, screaming at my real Uber driver, what's my name? The poor dude looks terrified, but responds with my name quickly, to which I reply, get me out of here, that man is trying to kidnap me. If I was in this Uber driver's position, I think I would be too shocked to react as quickly as he did. But my dude flew out of there, offered to call the cops for me, which I declined and now regret, and then walked me to the front door of my apartment, ensuring I got inside safely. Truly an incredible human being. You can rest easy knowing he got the fattest tip my college student bank would allow for, although he deserved much, much more. I was one of those kids you see walking around zoos or amusement parks wearing a leash. Those were already a thing 20 plus years ago but less common, and were initially only tied around the wrist. In my case it was a necessity. I would always start wandering off from the rest of the family no matter what situation. This is one of the stories that led to me earning my leash. It happened when I was about 6 years old, and I went to the zoo with my mom and sisters. Before every family outing, my mom made sure to give me the talk about not walking off again or face the consequences. My mom mom was a strict parent that made good on her promises, she had to, being a single mother of three. I didn't try to disobey her per se, but I often just didn't pay attention to the world and people around me. No different this day, I behaved and followed the group for a while, but then a butterfly garden caught my attention and off I was. When I finally realized I separated myself from my mom and sisters again, I panicked and started walking around the zoo looking for them, being afraid for my mom's reaction more than anything else. After a while, I somehow got it in my head that if I could just walk out, find have her car and wait there, my family would eventually find me. So I did. I got lost within a couple of minutes, walking around a strange neighborhood looking for either our car or the way back to the zoo. Nothing looked familiar. I started crying. 
Then this man came up to me, just normal looking, about 40 years old, asking if I'm lost. I explained I lost my family when we were visiting the zoo and I'm looking for the way back. I couldn't believe my luck when the man told me he had just come from the zoo and saw a family there standing near the entrance who were waiting for a little girl with blonde hair and a baseball cap. But it was still a few blocks away so he proposed I walked with him to his car and we could drive the rest of the way back. Just the mention of his car finally made me hesitant. I told him I wasn't allowed to get in a car with strangers. My mom would be mad. He then said something like, that was true but I looked smart enough to know that if I could trust someone. Don't remember the exact words but something like it. Also, he added, he spoke to my parents earlier when they were looking for me, so he's not a complete stranger. That didn't seem right. I asked him if he really talked to my dad, who had died a year before, and when he said he did, I broke down crying uncontrollably. I still didn't understand the situation I was in. I was just really confused about everything and scared of how angry my mom was going to be after all this. Finally, my crying caught the attention of the security guard of a parking building we were standing next to, asking if there was something he could help with. The guy stepped aside with the security guard and started explaining the situation, but made it vaguely sound like he was my father and we were looking for his wife. The security guard seemed to believe him, pointing us in the right direction towards the zoo. The man thanks the security guard and proceeds to take my hand to walk away. The security guard takes a last look at me and asks me, in a comforting, friendly, adult-to-child kind of way, why I'm still crying. I tell him that my dad is dead. He looks really confused for a few seconds, then asks if the man is not my dad. I tell him again, no, my dad is dead. In a split second, his whole face and posture changes and he turns to look at the guy, who is trying to explain he never actually said he was my dad, that the security guard must have misunderstood and he was just helping me find my mom. The security guard said he appreciated the man's help, but he would take me out of his hands now and the guy immediately took off. I don't think there was much else the security guard could have done. I explained the whole situation and after making a phone call, he walked me to the entrance of the zoo, which was just around the corner from the parking building, and from there we were brought to the security's office where my mom and sisters were already waiting. I feel extremely lucky for the security guard being at the right place at the right time that day, and very grateful for the extra second of time he took that could have made all the difference. Alright, so that's it. Hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, consider liking this video and subscribing to my channel. Let me know what you thought of these stories in the comments below. But as always, have a nice day.